it's very much around the best practice statement um, for holistic management of venous leg ulcers. Now, this was launched in Wounds UK um, in Harrogate uh, last year. So it's quite new, hot off the press, um, and I'll talk you through that about um, what, what that entailed. So I want to take this, pe this best practice statement, not just as a document, but tell you how we've put, put it into practice how it's benefited not just our clinicians, but be most of all our patients, and how it can be um, carried out across your community trust, your acute trust, your nursing homes, wherever you work, because I know we have a nice mixture of staff today. Let's set the scene then. Venous leg ulceration, prevalence and cost. I'm sure you've seen lots of figures out there around VLUs, and I'm just going to call it VLUs rather than keep saying venous leg ulceration. We know the biggest cause is venous insufficiency in the limb, okay, so it's a problem in the venous system, a raised pressure. And at 1.5% 1 1 of the adult population at any given time will have a lower limb ulceration, which doesn't sound a lot until you equate it to se over 730,000 people. And who's caring for those people? You guys, okay. So not only that, it's the amount of time. Not only time for the patient and the quality of life issues, which I'm going to move on to, but your time. The biggest cost is nursing or clinician time, okay? Because we, we do also have clinicians, non-RGNs, who are carrying out very good, effective lower limb management for patients, okay? So a big portion of your time. How many of us have time? How many of us have extra time or extra resources, especially in today's NHS arena? I can guarantee probably most of you today have either done this in your own time or you won't be being paid for it, okay? And thank you for coming because I know how difficult that can be. Some of you have been able to come in, your own, in, in works time. Thank you to your managers. Um, and who've supported you for the education in doing that. Um, but a lot of figures and a lot of work has been done around the health economics of wound care. I'm sure Simon touched on that. And over the last two years, Guest et al. and lots of other uh, senior leads have started to produce really good evidence about not just the cost to the patient's quality of life, but cost of wound care. And lots of the work now is... And, has led to the wound care sequin, which Simon told you about, the national two-year wound care sequin, because the government are now saying, hold on a minute, why is it costing so much? And why are patients still having lower limb problems for such a long length of time? One of Guest's articles talked about only 16% 16 pa 16 of patients with a lower leg ulcer at any point had had a ankle brachial pressure index or a Doppler. So I'll ask you to question what is happening to the other 84% of the population with a lower limb ulceration who are not having an ankle brachial pressure index or a Doppler. Okay. So again, it's not doom and gloom. It's just saying why this work came about. Why did we need to make changes in practice? And as I've just said to you, the, the <coughs> venous leg ulcers the, is you know, not just cost to you guys in time, resources, and cost to the NHS, but it's the biggest cost to the patients. I still see... Well, I had a patient who came into clinic yesterday, new patient, lower limb ulceration for two years. Now, you know yourselves, if you only have a wound for six weeks or six days, how, in, how that can incapacitate you in your work, in your home life, just discomfort, just racked off because you can't wash or shower the same. So imagine two years down the line, how you would feel if a clinician came along and said, yeah, we can help you with that. You probably would feel a little bit despondent and a little bit uncertain. So... Why did we develop the best practice? And I say we because I was part of the group that developed the best practice statement. And it was a mind of, of different clinicians, different varying experiences, some vascular specialists, some tissue viability specialists, some community nurse specialists, who came together to say there's such a disparity across nationally on lower limb ulcer care, which shows it with guesswork when only 16% of patients are having a Doppler. So how can we not just produce another document, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, how can we produce a document that you guys can use, okay, that isn't going to sit on a shelf, okay, but you can put into practice. So it was, it was a mind of, of clinicians coming together, and what we wanted to look at producing is just a very simple, 
clear assessment and treatment pathway for you to use, okay? And that pathway then also, we wanted it to link in with patient choice and empowerment and self-care. And a lot of the model of this practice statement is around self-care for your patients. And I'll share with you what we've been doing in Shropshire around patient self-care. And please, you know, if you disagree with that or you want to discuss it, that's what I'm here for, okay? So we wanted to, you know, also look at uh, management and prevention of reoccurrence because as we know 60 to not six over 67 percent of patients with a VLU at the moment reoccur so all that hard work you do you guys do and that the patient may do also at some point it's such high numbers that they're reoccurring why is that that was something we needed to look into and we very much wanted and, and this is what we'll be doing throughout today's presentation is challenge those um, myths and truths around VLU and there are a lot of myths and truths when we sat as a group and we were asking our colleagues there are quite a lot of myths and truths so hopefully we can help to uh, eradicate some of those today and clear some of those up for you um, so as I've just said this is why we developed the best practice statement we wanted to make it in line with current N NHS climate as well because it's all well and good saying oh yes do x y and z I know what it's like to to retain staff I know what it's like to actually you know uh, manage with less resources but do more and cost less and you guys have that pressure on you every day of the week Okay, I know we have to rely on agency and bank staff and we have some fabulous agency and bank staff but we have a varying level of skills. Okay, so we have to look at how we can best manage that and that was part of the work we were doing. I know that for a lot of the care home staff, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but any care home staff, sometimes staff re retention can be difficult. So you put a lot of training in for your staff and then three months later, your staff, some of your staff have left. You know, and, you, and you, you, again, you haven't got those skills because you're waiting to train the next number of staff up. So during today's session, we're going to consider key recommendations. I cannot go through everything, but I will say to you that after your break, you will have a copy of this on your seat. Okay, so ready for the next session. Um, it, it, is, it looks a big document, but there is plenty of tools in there you can take out of the document and, and use as a tool in your workplace. Okay, so we're going to look at it's the patient's assessment and treatment outcomes. Just a quick show of hands, you don't have to vote on this. How many of you have to report or record patient quality outcomes where wound care is concerned at the moment? So give you an example district nurse is brilliant district nurse has been seeing a patient for six months what you, 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 we all have to record our contacts don't we well we do in Shropshire the time where etc but how many of you are asked to say well what's the outcome of that six months has the wound decreased by 30 to 40 percent has it healed has it got larger this is coming patient quality outcomes and I'm not saying it's a bad thing because if it's six months, the wound's getting bigger and we've not challenged that or moved that patient on a longer pathway, which we'll show you referral on, you know, what is the outcome for that patient? So it's not a bad thing, but it just does mean there is going to be more work for you guys. But patient quality outcomes, I know the CCGs particularly and the trust are starting to ask us to measure them. Okay, so not just your activity, but also measure what is the quality outcome of your visit or your visits or the patient on the ward? What was the quality outcome of their stay with you? Same for the care homes, okay? But if we have the tools already in place, we're already going to be recording it, okay? And showing the good results as well. So in session one, we're going to look at holistic assessment, clarification around that VLU myths and truths. Um, and the wound and skin management and session two more then into how can we bring that into practice and self-empowerment self-care around compression therapy and prevention and we'll examine those myths and truths throughout we have a real patient not here with us but we have a real patient on the screen that I'm going to take you through that algorithm and show how it worked okay and how the best practice statement some of the guidance in that helped us to get what was right for him Okay, so I do believe that from research and evidence, quite a lot of care sometimes around leg ulcer is a little bit traditional um, and, and a little bit dogma. And by that, I mean, you know, oh, we've always done it that way. I think we're a lot better than that. But patients particularly are, you know, 
their past experience um, can influence what they will allow you to try and introduce. So, for instance, I remember in Stoke, I was a district nursing sister um, and a staff nurse around Cheadle, Leek and all around there. But you'd go in and you could smell the death up, you could smell the germaline before you even got through the door. And I still smell that now. You know, you still have the patients who say, you know, I know when I first moved to Shropshire, uh, we had a dermatologist who swore that every patient with lower limb wounds had to soak their leg in Lux Flakes. You know, but that was just tradition. It's how we've always done it. And trying to challenge that consultant was very difficult for me in my first two years of post. Um, and trying to stop the patients doing that, I say stop them, but advise them to stop doing that, was very, very difficult. So we have to know, you know, what are those myths, truths? What's the patient's expectations? Because we know what is right, you know, the right practice, the evidence-based practice, but do they? They only know what we're advising them. And still now I have a, a, a patient recently, who we went to their home, the wound was exposed. Why is your wound exposed? Well, I've just let the dog lick it. Yeah, as part from wanting to report them to the RSPCA, but their philosophy is the dog's saliva had more bacteria, uh, not more bacteria, uh, more properties to try and kill bacteria in the wound. That was their belief, okay? And we had to educate them that one, it's not fair on the dog, please don't do, allow the dog to do it. Um, but you know, it, it's all of those myths and truths that we have to, um, we have to challenge. And sometimes it's not he easy, as it wasn't for me with the consultant dermatologist. We sometimes have to challenge that tradition with our own colleagues. And it isn't easy, but sometimes by you guys coming here today, some of you will probably go back to your workplace and start to think about, and not challenge isn't a negative, it's a positive, and start to challenge practice a little bit. And that's what it's all about. Okay, so those with a vote of the put my teeth in, a voting pad. Um, can you vote for me? And I don't know who's voting and who isn't. How long does a wound have to be present before it is classified as a leg ulcer? Um, is it one to two weeks? And I think I've opened it. Yeah, I have. Uh, one to two weeks, two to four, three to six, or longer than six weeks? And again, I don't know who's voting. I don't know, you know, we'll know the answers in a minute, but they won't put your name up. You won't put, Pat said, six weeks. <laughs> Sorry, any Pats in the audience, because I don't know if your name is Pat, but I've just scared you now. You'll be like, no, I'm not emoting now. Okay, just close that one, and we'll have a little look. So, as you can see, one to two weeks, 23%. Two to four, sorry, four we two weeks is 23% majority are going for four weeks which if you read a lot of articles you know they are saying on average four to six weeks i'm really pleased that some of you are putting two weeks um you know but the myth before was that a wound had to be present on the lower limb for at least six weeks to be deemed as a leg ulcer the majority of you said between two and four and that's fab what I will say to you and what the group challenged, because bear in mind these were clinicians with different thoughts coming together and we were challenging each other on this. The truth is that really best practice statement is saying any cl clinicity of two weeks, you should be, you know, classing as a leg ulcer now. I will say, and this is, I got on my soapbox and the group agreed, any skin breakdown or potential skin breakdown to the lower limb classify it as an ulcer, potential ulcer, and start from day one, okay? Um, I know that's difficult, but what I'm saying is, the minute you assess the patient, start and move them along that pathway. But what we do say is that two weeks, they should have at least at two weeks. And you know with the wound care sequin now, everybody at four weeks should have had a robust holistic assessment. And I agree with that. I think our next sequin, after this one, will be our lower limb sequin. So if we're doing it right now, we're not going to have a problem later. So, um, and that was great, because like you say, but you only know what you're educated about, what you read in a journal, you know, and yes, less than a year ago, just over two years ago, we were told it's six weeks, then it was six to 12 weeks. So this is why we're bringing best practice up to date and bringing it to you guys um, and, and helping you with that. So let me introduce you to Ian, because Ian's going to follow us through a journey over the next two sessions, this session and the next one. Ian's a real patient, if you know what I mean. Um, he's got a, a leg ulcer secondary to having a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. 
Um, and immediately after the DVT, he experienced severe edema and pain, and then his lower limb started to break down, which is sometimes quite classical after a DVT. He was admitted um, post-acute admission and following treatment he was discharged and medically stable, but he's referred to you then, okay? But also what I will say to the acute staff in the ward, in the ward, who work on the wards, imagine that he hasn't been discharged and he is still with you because to me the management starts from day one, okay? But if you work in the community, this guy's coming to you, okay? He's post-DVT, his leg's swollen and the skin's starting to break down. Now we all know we start, we have to start with that assessment and this is the bit where my patients get frustrated with me because they come into the room, they jump on the couch or I go and see them at home and they're all there ready and waiting for me, you know, and the legs are up and I draw a chair up and I sit down and they look at me as if to say, God, she's bone idle. She's, she's only just come in and she's not doing anything because the general assessment of your patient is the crux. Whether it's wounds or, or lower limb problems, it's the crux because I'm hopefully getting so much information from Ian at this point before he even start to begin to look at his lower limb. Okay, so the sorts of things, and I'll put some of those up for you, I'll be looking at, of course, his medical family history, sorts of things, and I know I've only got a short piece of time, so I can talk for England, those that know me. I'll be asking about previous history of varicose veins, um, family history um, of lower limb ulceration, venous disease, you know, genetically, there can be a link there. Um, I'll be looking at his general medical assessment, so I know he's had a clot in his deep veins. So I know already there is going to be a problem with the venous return in that deep vein. Okay, so already from my assessment I know that. If we look at Ian, his general assessment, and he won't mind me saying he's a little bit rounded, he's a little bit overweight, so hydrostatic pressure from excessive weight around the ab abdomen will cause increased hydrostatic pressure in the veins in the abdomen as well as the legs. Okay, so weight is important when you're looking at that and considering that. So I, or, already I've got indicators, alarm bells saying this patient could have venous insufficiency. I'd be looking at previous surgery, fractures to the limb, because again, that can affect not just the venous return, but lymphatics. Was there any surgery in the groin? You know, any factors that might link into causing problems with either lymphatic drainage or venous return. Um, and certainly is polypharmacy, is medication. We know our patients are living longer. We don't need to be told that, do we? And hopefully I'll live longer as well, so you'll all keep me alive. But it means we may take more medication. Medication can affect lower limb um, ulceration. You know, patients who are put on high doses of, of uh, beta blockers or certainly put on beta blockers who have a narrowing in the artery and don't know about it, I classically guarantee you they may start with lower limb ulceration it'll uh, constrict the, the peripheries. Methotrexate, your patients who are on that for whatever reason will slow down wound healing, so if they have a lower limb. I'm not saying you can stop that drug, but work with the consultant if it is affecting the wound healing. Okay, so think of the drugs they're on, why are they taking it, how will it affect them? Lifestyle issues, you know, we, we all associate VLUs normally with patients who are standing for long periods or you have stasis of blood, so I'm always moving and I'm this camera guy, sorry don't know your name but you're going to hate me because he tells me to stand still and I move around a lot so I do apologise. But stasis of blood, we did associate VLUs with people who stood in factories, cold places, but I see young patients, all age of patients now, all occupations come in with lower limb problems. Majority, lorry drivers who wear the stasis of the blood because they are just driving. Reps, any reps in the audience? They're not stopping, getting out the car, walking around. The biggest bugbear I have, I walk into our IT department and they always just, you know, there's that groan when I walk in because I just give them a bit of stick because it's all right. But they're in this office and they're sat at the, doing all the bits because it's great because I don't know how to do it. But I'll say, you know, I'm sat there waiting for them to do something with my laptop. And they wheel themselves about two foot to the, to, to the photocopier. And then they wheel themselves. And I look and I'll go, what are you doing? And they'll go, what, Joy? And I'll say, get up, 
walk. And they go, ooh. And, I'll, and they also are getting, and I have said to a couple of them, you're getting a little bit rounded because they're sitting there. They don't even go out for lunch. So I said, do you realise you're at risk of a clot, you're at risk of edema, and you need some compression socks if you're going to do that all day? And then they go, the usual, can you measure me for some then, Joy? But they joking apart, I saw a young lad in my clinic who's 16. Yes, he has an issue with his weight at the moment, but this is going to be a problem for a lot of our younger population, obesity and bariatric, we're seeing it. So they don't have to have venous disease to have problems in the veins because their hydrostatic pressure from the abdominal veins is enough. You know, but they do, they get problems in the lower limb with edema mm. and the youngest in my clinic at the moment is a 16 year old boy with lower limb ulceration. So you imagine his quality of life and the risks later on in life. It's not just now. Um, and we all picture somebody with a VLU probably 70 plus. No, I picture my patients with VLUs at least 30 plus now at the moment because they're getting more DVTs, lifestyle, occupation. We've got to get these people moving. We've got to, and, and this is where the ownership is, putting it back on the patient. And I'll talk, see, I told you I could talk for in England. The psychosocial issues, you know, for Ian, uh, I'll tell you about his issues. He was daunted by the, the prospect of having ulcers for the rest of his life, okay, or having a wound. He was married, he, he had a very good social life, but he locked himself away when the wound started to break down. I've had patients who I've sent for counselling, marriage guidance counselling, because some of these patients haven't shared a bed with their partner for many years because of the smell, the embarrassment, the pain. Okay, and also just shared life, just gone out of the front door. You know, you imagine at 30, 40 with a lower limb ulceration and what it would mean to you. Can you give up work? Can you have time off work? I enjoy my work actually, so financially I couldn't long term, you know, but equally I enjoy it as well, so I don't want to stay off work. All those impacts, and I could talk and talk about it because I feel really passionate about the patient's perspective. You know, what are their thoughts about it? Okay, oh, I think I've gone backwards. And then we'd look at the limb. And at this point, the patient's really getting rattled with me because I haven't even looked at the wound yet. So I'll look at the limb and, you know, vascular assessment does include your Doppler. It's essential. What I will say is that some of us don't have the skills to do a Doppler assessment or ankle brachial pressure index. Unfortunately, we can't just use that to say, I haven't done an ABPI and we haven't put them in compression because I can't do it. I appreciate don't do it. If you've not got the knowledge and skills, please don't do it. But you have to facilitate that being done, okay? Even if the patient's on the ward, in a community uh, hospital bed, in the community or in a care home. It's not an excuse. And as, as uh, my colleague Simon said, it's no excuse when, if you stand in coroner's court to say you haven't done something. Yes, you can say, because I haven't got the skills, but the patients, you've been seeing the patient for 12 weeks. Why didn't they have an ankle bacterial pressure index done, a Doppler? It's gold standard, it's standard care. A mission of care is just as bad as doing it wrong. Okay, so d that isn't to scare you, but just think about it. How are you gonna facilitate that for all that patient? Same with compression therapy, which we'll go on to after the break. So you need to then also look at the limb, look at factors such as edema, any hemocidrine staining, any signs of venous disease, varicose veins, ankle flare. Again, I could do a whole day on lower limb ulceration and show you the pictures. But just, you know, looking for those signs and symptoms and the mobility, because we know good venous return relies on us being able to walk or just dorsiflex and plantar flex your foot. Okay, so even if you draw your toes towards you now, you feel your calf going tight, you relax your foot and it relaxes. If your patient's not got much mobility, encourage them to do that if they're able to do so, because that is enough to aid that venous return. And then the wound and skin assessment, which I'm going to take you through in a little bit more detail. We, we then start to look at the wound, and this is the bit the patient thinks you're interested now. But again, explain to your patients, I am asking you these questions, I am doing these tests and looking at this lower limb before I get to your wound, because I have a really good indicator of what we may be dealing with and how we can best manage it. Now, what the, I'll ask you another question now. ABPI assessment confirms the presence of a venous leg ulcer. Can you... Um, well, I won't ask you because I'm putting you on the spot. Is that true or is it false? Okay. 
It's a fundamental component of assessment of, of VLU, but ABPI does not diagnose venous insufficiency or venous disease. It excludes the presence of arterial disease, which, as we know, if arterial disease is present, it's contraindicated to put compression on without guidance. Okay, so it doesn't diagnose a venous leg ulcer or venous disease, it just helps to eliminate the presence of significant arterial disease, um, but it is important to do. Okay, so also for classification, once we've assessed, and I'm not going to go, I'll, I'll go back a little bit, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because time won't let me allow, but some, some of my colleagues and some, and some others don't tend to use a simple VLU and a complex VLU. What I'll be honest, in Shropshire we don't. To me a VLU is a VLU and I will look at, at the algorithm and assess it and manage it because it's a VLU. Some areas are looking at um, a definition of a simple and a complex, so a simple being you've got your ABPI between 0.8 and 1.3. What I will say with your Doppler readings, go to your local guidance please because that may vary. This is ours in Shropshire. Okay, ankle uh, area circumference of, of less than 100 centimetres, etc. And then you can classify it as a more complex. But I just think part of your assessment and using your algorithm, you would be bearing this in mind anyway the size, the length, the depth, you know, wounds failing to heal. So, following this, then, we've examined Ian, we've had a chat with him, we've done an assessment, and I'm sure there's lots of things that I've probably missed, but you know, lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, because it is important, because a lot of patients will say to you, I'm sure you've heard them say to you, why are you not healing my wound? What are you doing wrong? The fact that they carry on smoking 40 cigarettes, drinking two bottles of wine a night, um, sit around, eating what they want, you put it back. I'm helping to facilitate the wound to heal, but you have to help as well because it's your body that will heal the wound, okay, with the right uh, treatment in place. So you have to put ownership back, and I know that's easier said than done. 30 years nursing, I know that can be difficult. So we know Ian, and Ian's an ex-nurse, so I didn't tell you that. But, so what do they say about nurses and clinicians? A little bit of knowledge can be a, you know. I'll be the world's worst patient. You'll hope I don't come back to Stoke when I retire, I tell you. Um, but he is. He had a history of a DVT. He's got excruciating pain in this limb. He's got gross edema. And this is his leg, as you can see there. He's got significant ulceration. His ABPI is within what we call a normal range, and he is suitable for compression. But when we talked to him about it, and it wasn't me, it was my colleague, he was daunted by the fact of compression. Because again, and he's a nurse, but again, what are your thoughts about that? So we move on to the wounded skin assessment, and it was really good listening to Simon talk about the triangle of assessment. Whatever tool you use, try and use a, a, a tool that you're all going to be using similar, the same. Okay, it'll allow consistency of assessment and reassessment. Okay, and a tool is a guide. It's there to stimulate your thoughts. It's there to trigger points. It's there to help you to move that on. Um, what we worked on for best practice statement is we looked at the time framework and we added on. Okay, so what we came up with, and it was launched with the best practice statement, you are all free to use it, download it, do whatever you would like with it, is times. Because we felt skin was so important, especially when it came to VLU. And it was something that we felt was being missed a little bit. So we used the times framework as part of our really good um, principles of removing the barriers to wound healing. Because that's what times is, you're removing the barriers. Okay, so for instance, tissue. We, we know about tissue that devitalized tissue, uh, slough, etc., will delay a wound healing. It could exacerbate a wound because the bacteria love devitalized tissue. You will always have bacteria in a break to the skin and on the skin. But it's that multiplication, that proliferation of bacteria that can trigger things to go wrong. So, devitalized tissue, bacteria, slough, we need to minimize. We need to remove, okay, because it will delay or cause deterioration. So debridement is so, so important. What it also does is removes the dead cells and so we can expedite the wound healing. What methods, well, no, I'll, what methods of debridement might you use then? So you, a, a lot of us probably rely very much on autolytic, don't we? 
um, the wound dressing itself or, or the, the thing we put on. Autolytic is also the body's own way of debriding. A body's very clever if it's able to. It will start to send in white blood cells. It's very a little bit more than that, but send in the white blood cells and the fighters, as I call them, the scavengers, will break down that devitalised tissue. But how long do we wait for autolytic debridement? If I have a patient who's autoimmune um, suppressed, okay, can we wait two to four weeks? How long do you wait? So you put a treatment plan in place. How long do you wait for autolytic debridement with your wound dressings? It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Your patients have all got different risk factors, okay? But yes, we start, we do, we do rely on our wound dressings, our wound uh, properties. Also, I'm a big believer that debridement comes from cleansing the wound as well, and, and the skin, okay? So how many of you, I'm, I'm, I'm a picker, I'll put my hands up. I trained in Stoke, we had to be a picker, okay? I love picking, do I have time to pick? No, okay? Do I really want my patient keep hitting me on top of the head sometimes when they're a bit worried about what I'm removing? But joking apart, you do though, however, have to remove that devitalised skin or surrounding area. And how do you do that most effectively? Soaking now, I, I mean I trained many years ago and we soaked all our leg ulcers. We washed and soaked and I still believe in that. But we don't always have the facilities, we don't always have the home environment that's suitable. We don't now have the time, and I'm honest, I am honest, I know what it's like. Practice nurses in the audience, I know you're lucky if you have a 10 minute slot. District nurses, you're lucky if you have a whatever slot, to, but lower limb, but I still, on some of my limbs I will put them in, not my limbs, but the patient's limbs. So we have to look at other methods as well. And one area that we've included in our formulary is the monofilament fibre technology, so the, the, the mechanical debridement of that. Here you can see a limb, okay, sloughy, needs attention, not just the slough, the surrounding skin, okay, it needs debriding. You can see a bucket there, bucket's not lined and it's not my patient, so I'll put my hand up to that, any infection control, <coughs> make nurses in the audience. Um, but you can see that how much time have we got maybe to try and debride that. Think about your resources, so you need to debride it, you need your dressings, you're looking at potentially an ulcer. You might, some of your colleagues might say, right, I'm going to put them in compression bandaging after. So you can see how your, your thought processes are regarding your time and your resources and your treatment plan. Five minutes after debriding with the monofilament pad, now what would you do? Okay. Can you see my resources are going to be tied in a little bit differently now? Because actually I haven't got a really deep ulcer. I've got some superficial skin loss. But after five minutes I can see what I'm dealing with. Okay. I can say... Do you need to bandage that limb, compression-wise? They are suitable, by the way. Do you need a bandage? Not necessarily now, okay? So if I don't need a bandage, but I want compression, so I'll use a compression hose kit, do you need an RGN to do that? So already you're thinking of your skin mix. So this is why we looked at the, the Deadly Soft pad a long time ago, and, and it was this that brought it off, you know, time, it's time and it's gentle and a lot of, I, I see children and a lot of the children I see when we have to divide their wounds, they do it, so they get the pad or the lolly, and they love the lolly, because it looks like the lolly, and let them do it, your patients can do it themselves, they know their pain for their shoulders, okay, so just think about, you know, how are you going to do it, how much time have you got and how long can we wait for natural autolytic divide I know there's other methods, there's sure, there's larva therapy. I use larva therapy. Again, thinking your time and resources. Okay, but I'm not knocking those because, you know, but you have to wait. Sharp debridement, you've got to wait for a clinician with the training to come and sharp debride. And I was sharp debriding yesterday. I put maggots on a patient the day before. So you can only use what's in your toolbox, though. And if you've got something that you can generally use throughout your day, and it doesn't have to be, because there's less RGNs and there's going to be less RGNs, we've got to start skill mixing. So the I in times is infection, inflammation and biofilms. And when I first learned about biofilms, I thought, oh God, here we go, because I'm not very sciencey and I'm not going to remember it all. But in most chronic wounds, the majority, up to 90% of chronic wounds, at some point will have biofilms, or if not constant biofilms in. They're hard to recognise, and I'll agree with that. But to me, biofilms, bacteria, they're always present. The trouble with the biofilm is 
bacteria on a wound, say it's your wound, sorry I'm picking on you, but you have bacteria, you have a wound, okay, and that wound, plantonic bacteria, attaches it to the collagen of the, your wound, and your natural autoimmune system, your antibodies will kick in, um, I might use an antimicrobial, and that'll destroy a few as well, <coughs> but some get left behind, and it's those that get left behind, if we don't constantly disturb, form a little colony. And in a very simple way, we get a, a large, extra, a very robust extracellular matrix that forms around that colony. So your antibodies kick in, or you as a clinician as an antimicrobial, or the doctor comes along and gives you some antibiotics. It's not that he can't kill the bacteria, he can't get to it. Okay? He can't penetrate the extracellular matrix wall. So it's not that you can't fight it, or your body's got resistant to it, you know, it just can't get through the wall. The best way of breaking down that wall and removing the bacteria or lowering the, the levels down is constant debridement. So, you all woke up this morning and you had a biofilm in your mouth, okay? And you all did that, probably not, but, but you're all doing it now. And you will feel a biofilm. You can see it on your teeth. You can feel it on your teeth. What did you do? You brushed your teeth, okay. Did you just get the toothpaste that's really good anti antibacterial toothpaste, whitening even and all sorts of things it can do, and just put it on your teeth? No. You got a mechanical agent and brushed it, didn't you? Would you do that just once a week? No. Well, <laughs> I'm not asking you to put your hands up. But you wouldn't because those biofilms are reforming within 24 to 48 hours can become a mature biofilm think of your wounds. So you need to mechanically disrupt that bacteria and those biofilms so that then your treatment, what you're doing, can do its job. But not just the wound, the surrounding skin as well. If it's hyperkeratotic, uh, etc., dry skin, the bacteria will have a party in there as well. Okay? And a lot of patients, I'll talk to you about hyperkeratosis in, in a little while, but that will affect even just putting compression on. So you can see it has to be a consistent ongoing. And it has to be something that we can all do, not just one of us or a couple of us. Okay, big question then. Should you continue compression, ugh, compression if the patient has cellulitis? And this is going back to our myths and truths again. And again, this is yes, no, or not sure. I love it when I hear you all muttering, because that's good. It means we're getting some. Unless you're muttering about me, and then that's different. <laughs> so, going to the answer is yes, no, and not sure. And those that answered no, you're right, because you, up until recently, cellulitis, take the compression off. Don't put it back on for at least six weeks. Don't put it on for four weeks. Don't put it on for two months. Yeah. And it was, it, it was that philosophy. Now, is a myth, because really, what causes cellulitis? Well, I know you can get a bite, but what happens in a limb when it's cellulitic? You get edema, don't you? Okay. Now, I agree it can be painful, and I've had cellulitis in the, in the limb. Okay, that was from a bite. But if you can, if the patient's pain is controlled, and they are fairly comfortable, if you can apply the compression because if anything you're going to help uh, with lymphatic drainage and venous return and hopefully prevent any ulcers developing if they do develop so i.e take you back to ian he had a dvt the dvt his leg swelled the leg swelled he got poor venous return and he got an ulcer now maybe if we'd have started a little bit earlier on the ulcer might not have developed See where I'm coming from. But it was a myth. I used to say, cellulitis, don't put compression on. Can't put that on yet. Okay. But this is, again, this is why we guys try and put the evidence together for you because you haven't got the time to go and read that article and that article and that piece of research. You need, you need people to do that for you. You're far too busy to be doing that. So do trust us, though, because we have looked at the evidence and the research. The M in the times is your moisture imbalance. And, and this can be difficult. Please, I know what it's like in practice. I have patients who walk into clinic with carrier bags around the legs and 
feel really proud because they've t t put a hand towel around certain shopping bag and it hasn't leaked joy and I'm like that's not quality of life that's really sad and whatever but we can deal with that and and you know we learn from our patients don't we but this is how they're living um, and moisture imbalance to me is one of the big uh, factors psychosocial factors that affect our patients most most of my patients if I start from day one and say what what what's your objective or you know or what's your aim for us to do and I guarantee you most of your patients won't say first of all I want you to heal my ulcer joy it will be stop the smell stop the leaking then on top of that it's added bonus if you heal it but can you see their thoughts are slightly so the first thing they'll want probably is to stop the leaking I had a lady once come to clinic she came in a, um, a patient car type thing transportation she was in floods of tears and I sat her down and I said what, what on earth's the matter she got a, a lower limb wound I'd not met her before it was wrapped up in all sorts of things and she got in this car and she got out the car and there was a wet patch on the back of the seat and the man accused her of being incontinent you know, and that was so embarrassing to her. You know, you, you almost said, oh, I think you've wet yourself. Well, she hadn't. It was from, for, so you can imagine how devastating that is. So if we can get the moisture balance right, but a lot with VLUs, a lot of the excessive moisture is because we're not encouraging that venous return or there's lower limb edema that we're not reducing. So if you can get compression on with VLUs, a lot of the battle for your moisture imbalance, uh, if it's excessive, um, will be restored. But equally, yes, your dressings are important. You certainly, your secondary dressings, if you have excessive exudate like Ian did, you may have to start thinking about y y your um, secondary dressings and using that. Because reducing moisture balance, okay, what's the, the moisture sitting on the wound, and the peri wound skin, what's it contain? This this moisture off the off the wound. It's not clear water, is it? Yeah, you, it's proteins, enzymes, irritants, everything that's going to irritate the skin, and also that the bacteria love to multiply and proliferate. Okay, so we have to remove it and let it sit away from that area. But equally, we don't want to dry the leg out. So over to you guys again. Can superabsorbents be used under compression? Yes, no, or not sure. Have a little look at that. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, some of you know, and I understand this as well, and I totally do understand this. Um, I'll just put the myth up. That there was a myth that you couldn't use superabsorbent dressings, particularly under compression, okay? Because of all factors, they, uh, that it may affect the sub-bandage pressure, um, that it would mean the exudate sits on the skin um, underneath the compression. Also, you know, it added bulk to, um, to the sub-bandage pressure. But superabsorbents, you know, from the research, from the evidence, evidence, can be used and should be used, really, if there's high levels of exudate or, or, or moderate to high levels. Because what you're going to do then is prevent the skin macerating, the peri wound skin macerating, reduce the bacterial burden because it's sitting within the dressing, the exudate, and et cetera, um, and also encourage that. Um, any sub bandage materials, if you put it on the outside, all it's going to do is just sit and make the, the limb and the skin uh, boggy and soggy. And the other thing it's going to do, it's going to be distressing visually to the patient and it's going to smell. So those, all those other factors. So you can. The wound edge then is, is as it is, the wound edge. You always keep an eye on the wound edge. Now, from the wound edge point of view, we want to see the wound edge decreasing in size, width and length, but certainly from the base of the wound as well. Um, and a good indicator is what they're saying now, and this will be looking at your patient quality outcome measures, is that any wound within um, 6 to 12 weeks that can start to reduce in size by 30 to 40%. So just getting percentage averages that the wounds... So making sure you regularly measure and size your wounds to see if it's going along that trajectory. The other thing I put about edges, though, is if the edges look suspicious, rolled, or, or you know, you're not quite sure, do get advice because sometimes these lower limb ulcers can be suspicious, they can be malignant, um, there could be other indicators, um, so bear that in mind. But with your edge, what you're wanting to do is make sure the peri wound edge is nice and healthy, it's not wet, it's not macerated, it's not too dry, because dry skin and hyperkeratosis will greatly affect the wound healing. 
migration in and, and, and across, but equally um, for the patients as well, and that we're not missing any other etiology. And surrounding skin is the one we added, the S to the times, because it's so important. That was your foot on the top of that page, and I came along with all the will in the world and said, oh, put you some cream on and then I'm going to bandage it. Probably an hour after, two hours after, you would want to probably rip the bandage off and scratch it and itch it because it's dry. But how many, you know, it's, it's the time to keep doing that. So debride the skin first, you know, so we haven't got time to put it in a bucket and nice emollient, give it a wash. So think about the monofilament pad, the debris soft pad to do that for you. Five, six minutes, the patient can be doing it themselves, could they not? Okay, um, and just think how quick and, and that is. And there's best practice statements um, over the compression therapy says that hyper unresolved hyperkeratosis, so dry skin or pla plaques of skin, will affect the compression therapy. Okay, so you need to, cons and it has to be consistent because I'm sure if you're anything like me and you've done a really good skincare regime and then two days later you see the patient again and you think, oh, it's all dry again, it has to be a consistent mechanism but not just applying the cream because if I put cream on that top image it, you know without washing debriding I might as well put it on a brick wall because it's not really going to penetrate is it okay the more comfortable your patient's skin is guess what they're going to comply more with the compression okay because that's one of the main reasons patients will take the compression off so just to recap on Ian's journey then he's got we now diagnose he's got a venous leg ulcer because he has venous insufficiency he has a DV, previous DVT. He's suitable compression, but he's daunted by it, and he is in pain. We've done the time. We know the slough present on his wound. We know there's possible biofilms because he has had the wound a while. And sometimes with biofilms, you see that shiny appearance to the wound bed itself. We know there's a lot of moisture there. We can see the shape of his limb. His, his limb is quite uh, distorted in shape. And this will take you on to the next session when we look at limb distortion and move you along the pathway. Okay, so we know there's moisture. We know the edges aren't advancing in, but they look typical. I hate the word typical, but they do look typical of a venous leg ulcer. I'm not querying whether there may be any different etiology there. And his skin, there's lots of hyperkeratosis, as you can see, uh, surrounding skin. And peri-wound skin needs some TLC. So that's his journey so far, which then will take us on to the journey after coffee, uh, where we say we've assessed Ian himself, we've done a general assessment, we've had a little chat with him about how he feels about possible treatments, we've looked at his limb and the skin and the limb shape and we've carried out a vascular assessment to our ability, you know, so we've done an ABPI, not just doing the ABPI, we've looked at the sensation in the limb, the colour, the perfusion, the warmth, how it feels to him and he indicates the pain. And now we're ready to move him on. So we've thought about improving the skin and the wound, but we're going to then think about the best options on the best practice guidance from compression therapy. So thank you very much. Any questions before coffee? No? But hopefully it's helped to stimulate a few thoughts about how you can put this in practice. <laughs>